The next film we uh, subjected ourselves to, again, because we've all seen this at least once before. It was my first time. <gasps> it was my first time. Caro has never seen Hackers, yeah. which is I also strangely. Oh! Whoa, really? Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is episode 41. I'm your host, Anita Sarkeesian, and I'm joined by my very own Crash and Burn, Ebony Astor and Carolyn Pettit. Hey! What's up? This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love, or alternatively, we're the feminist killjoys coming for your media, depending on your perspective. Today's show is a 90s cyberpunk double feature with Strange Days and Hackers. And as always, we'll finish the show by all sharing a little something in What's Your Freak Out? Now on with the show. What's up, y'all? Hey. Hey. So, so, uh, so, I, so, <laughs> so we're talking about a few tech-themed uh, films uh, today. Uh, Anita, you played some D&D this weekend, yeah. right? But your but your D&D campaign is like tech oriented, right? Is it it's, like is it, would like, you call it cyberpunk or Oh yeah, okay. it's like a hard sci it's a hard sci-fi okay. world that is using the D&D 5 rules. Rules. Okay. Uh so it's there's a lot of like I I think I've mentioned before my druid character can instead of like the speaking with plants and speaking with animals spells yeah. go to technology. Right. Uh fun thing is I have Convince well, it wasn't hard, but I convinced my my shipmates that the little bots around the ship are actually DRDs from Farscape. If anyone is a Farscape fan, and so now they're just like it's in the canon as DRDs, which makes me so happy. Okay, I don't know what a DRD they're is. They're like they're like basically Roombas oh, okay. in the Farscape universe, okay. but like they're they like clean and repair Aww. and do shit in cute. on the ship. Cool. And they, I want one of those. They're so cute. Yeah. I was at Dragon Con one year and I saw folks like cosplaying as drds wow. and i ran up two flights of stairs or no escalators i ran up escalators to find them because i was like that's the most amazing cosplay yeah so what up farscape fans um yeah, yeah. anyways that D D was loads of fun it, i'm getting sort of sucked in i bought a I bought some dice. Dude, that I, photo of your new dice that I saw. They're great. They're, they're so, so beautiful. But so now I need to buy the like the the tray that you you shoot the dice in because they're so heavy they're gonna damage t- uh, any t- table uh, that I yeah, roll them on. Yeah. And now I want a mini of my character. It's a whole thing. Yeah. I'm no, getting sucked into this fucking bullshit world. I feel you. I mean, uh, there's something about like when I see d- those pictures of dice, it's like, oh man, I really I wanna get back into D D or something myself. Like I wanna, you know, there's just the the aesthetics of it all, like the tactility of it, you know, it's just something that obviously a video game c- can't uh, produce. Yeah. And there's just something special no, about totally. it. All right, yeah. y'all. Let's get into some entertainment news. What do we got on the docket, Carol? So, uh, yeah, first of all, uh, we have a story about uh, Serena Williams, the greatest tennis player in, you know, the history of the world. Like, at least arguably, like, that is a, that is a totally I'd fair statement. I'd say the universe. Um, the expanding uh, universe. Okay, all right. I mean, wow. You know, <laughs> G- Gorblock's the Ingleblorb on uh, the planet Neutron is pretty good, too. But, uh, you know, I mean, you know. They ain't got nothing on Serena. Fair, fair. Um, so at the French Open has banned Serena or, or ruled that Serena Williams may not wear this uh, Nike-designed Wakanda-themed uh, sort of catsuit that was designed for Serena Williams specifically to to um, like reduce the danger of blood clots, which are a medical issue that Serena Williams has had to contend with. And it's just like mind-blowing, I mean, all or not mind blowing at all that Serena Williams gets like singled out for this. Um, as uh, so, Billy Jean King, um, the great tennis champion, tweeted. Um, the policing of women's bodies must end the quote unquote respect because they said, well, you know, she needs to respect the game, like whatever that means. Like she needs to wear like a fucking skirt, you know, a little short skirt on the on the court or whatever. So Billie Jean King said that the quote respect that's needed is for the exceptional talent Serena Williams brings to the game. Criticizing what she wears to work is where the true disrespect lies. Um, yeah, and Serena Williams, um, you know, in typical like, I mean, she uh, just goes so far above and beyond what anyone should be expected to do in terms of like rising above the issues and not like 
uh, you know, she she said something like, uh, you know, it's fine, guys. Uh, everything's fine. When it comes to fashion, you don't want to be a repeat offender. She kind of made like a little joke about it at a press conference. But obviously, like there are real issues of racism um, and sexism like at play here. Um, so it's yeah, it's messed up. It's super bullshit. Yeah. Um, this is a, this uh, next story is, uh, kind of grim and tragic, but it would be conspicuous and, and unfortunate if we, if we didn't touch on it, at least, uh, on Sunday at a, at a location called the GLHF a game bar in Jacksonville, Florida, um, there was a shooting that occurred at a Madden, uh, you know, Madden football, uh, video game tournament, um, in which two, uh, two competitors, two, uh, players were killed, um, their names are Taylor Robertson, who was known online by his handle Spot Me Please or Spot Me, and um, Eli uh, True Clayton, also known as True Boy. Um, and uh, the shooter was um, uh, David Katz, was a competitor in the tournament who was eliminated, and it's sort of believed or speculated that his that the shooting was. Uh, a kind of reaction to him being eliminated from the tournament. Um, and obviously, uh, this opens up so, so so many issues in a much larger discussion than we have the time or ability to get into right now. But, um, you know, people often talk about the links between, you know, video games and violence as some kind of causality thing. But when they do that, they're talking about games like, you know, if they're trying to kind of create a, a sort of hysteria around it, they use games like Doom or, uh, you know, like games in which with a lot of sh- violent shooting and gory like violence of that nature and of course american football is a brutal sport that leads to severe injuries and the degradation of of men's bodies but it's it's also not typically the kind of game that people think of you know when they think of violent games and being linked to like actual any any link to actual violence and you know it's just to me it's it's just a, a, another American gun tragedy that speaks to the need for us to confront both our lack of gun control laws and our uh, severe problems with like to- with just toxic masculinity run amok. Right, those are the conversations that we keep not wanting to have. Uh, okay, lastly, I want to talk about a, a, a tweet that went out. This is. Uh, going to be related in some ways to the main topic on this episode. So the next big game from CD Projekt Red, makers of the you know acclaimed uh, epic open world RPG, The Witcher Three, uh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which Anita loved. Uh, their next game is is Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, which is an uh, open world as the t- cyberpunk epic RPG. Um, you know, b- which takes some inspiration from an from a tabletop uh, cyberpunk. Uh, role-playing game and obviously like there's so much excitement and interest and enthusiasm about this game you know um and but uh in this past week a fan tweeted at them in response to like a, a photo they tweeted uh, a fan responded like we want we want more guys which i don't know what that even means but cyberpunk 27's 2077's twitter response was um did you just assume their gender which is such a transphobic, you know, meme that that is so kind of commonplace in a lot of toxic circles of the Internet. Right. It's meant to sort of mock their idea of what they think like transgender people uh, say or like how we think or how we behave. It's it's basically it's just another in uh, from the same kind of school of like I identify as an attack helicopter. Like it exists to sort of mock and dismiss the validity of trans identity. Um, and they were severely called out on it, and they deleted the tweet and they apologized. But the apology they issued was um it, it was of the sorry to all those offended nature, which is the worst kind of apology because it suggests that the problem isn't with what we said. The problem is that some people took offense to it. So it lets those who feel like, oh, it was just a harmless joke or like, you know, LOL, that was funny, you know, fuck the SJWs for raising a stink about it. It lets them feel like, oh, you know, Cyberpunk 2777 is kind of on their side, you know, and just feels like, oh, we had to do this because all these people got offended, not because what we said was fucked up. Yeah, totally. And yeah. 
Well, and the thing is that this developer is not known for being progressive yeah. or like at all supportive of like making yeah. progressive media, right? Yeah. Like the Witcher franchise from the beginning has been at the forefront of our trope series, right? Like there's been a lot of like awful representation of women mm-hmm. in it and like They've not, yeah. So I'm not surprised, and I'm extremely disappointed that this is still a thing that's happening in games, and that developers still like, yeah, get to be shitty about like identity issues. Yeah, and this ra- raised an interesting conversation uh, or debate about what it what cyberpunk really means, because one person. Uh, got a, a like a, you know a few thousand retweets by tweeting like the most cyberpunk thing you can do is be kind and respectful to people online and that's like a nice sentiment. What? Because, yeah, well, it's like- well, I mean, no, I mean, I get, I get where they're coming from. They are coming from like the the idea that cyberpunk has a political core of being like anti corporation and like pro, um, you know, like individual and like there is a lot of like of like landmark cyberpunk stuff that has i think that kind of if you if you dig into its politics it has that but obviously there's there's plenty of c- cyberpunk that that doesn't as well and like other people tweeted stuff like well no the most cyberpunk thing you can do is like fly your hover car in the rain or like through through the neon lit skies over the corporate arcologies you know or whatever and and it's like this this debate between like like a stat like we as human beings are so kind of um easily seduced by like aesthetics and to so many people like cyberpunk is it's rain and gloom and neon and like tech and and uh while to other people it's like oh no it, it's about this this anti corporate like pro human like p- political ideology and um you know i think these conversations come up like all the time um in all kinds of like science fiction media because it's it's so easy for for images to kind of glorify and be seductive like it's you know these convers- similar conversations i think happened with mad max where you know, to to some of us, to some people, it's this like bold feminist statement. To others, though, it's it like what you walk out of that film with is like, whoa, that was badass. That like that like blasted future Earth. Like, oh, you know, I'd love to like ride a fucking car dune buggy. with yeah with dune buggy <laughs> with like machine guns strapped to it across and the, the desert with the guitar. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like <laughs> like. I, you know, I always I think that a lot of critics and a lot of people when it, when debating or discussing this stuff want to dismiss how how easily seduced we are by like beautiful aesthetics and how much those can like override any like underlying political, you know, meaning that some may say a, a work has. Yeah, I mean, I don't I'm not I haven't seen the. I saw the tweet of from yeah. them, but I haven't seen the debate and unfurl. And yeah, like you. You can't remove the aesthetics from cyberpunk. That's just a, an ingrained right. part of how we define the genre yeah. of it. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't change, and it doesn't mean it's not. It, that's always there. And you know, it is really disappointing when people do try to strip politics out of, um, you know, like God. Like it's it. Cyberpunk is such a huge genre too that it's it, it's a weird thing to be like. I mean, there are parameters around it, but it's a weird thing to be like. Yeah, but, yeah. From from your description, this debate sounds stupid. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, but I moving. But, on. I, but it's frustrating when people try to strip the politics out of things that are very clearly there because it doesn't gel with them. When it, right. like you might not like it, but it's there. Yeah, right. Like that is the anti-establishment piece of this is so huge, and it always has been. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that would be a great segue into our next segment. Although but gonna ruin it. I sure am. I would like to take a moment to let our listeners know that they can help us keep making Feminist Frequency and bringing it to their airwaves, their personal devices, their, uh, you know, listening, listening the, the, items. The implants, <laughs> the, the cyber implants that allow them to get the bo- podcasts. Jacked in. Yeah. They jack in the podcast exactly. in their brains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They can continue having yeah. that amazing technology uh, while there are neon lights behind them uh, by backing us at d.rip slash femfreak. And if you do that, you get some special perks like a bonus segment, which we're going to have. 
every week, <laughs> uh-huh. including this week, uh, and some other fun perks. So please help us out. Uh, anything you want to chip in is useful yeah. to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it really to make this. It helps, really helps us. It's keep weird. Doing the show. It's weird how money does that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That uh, whole plug sounded like that bit from um, 30 Rock with Steve Buscemi in the school when he goes undercover and is like, how are you doing, fellow kids? <laughs> I didn't watch that show, but that sounds really funny. Anyways, check us out, d.rip slash femfree. Now yeah. it's time for the main segment. <laughs> Uh, this week, we are gifting you with a double feature from the 90s. It's not a gift. It's not a gift. It is a it is a flaming paper bag of dog shit that we left on your doorstep. Wow. Big words, The Ebony. movies might be that or not. But, but we are the gift. Yeah. God, Ebony. Yeah. All right. Let me set us up. Uh, we're going to talk about Strange Days, which is a 1995 film directed by Catherine Bigelow and written by James Cameron and Jay Cox. It's about Lenny Nero, who is played by Ralph Fiennes, who is a former cop. I think it's Rafe Fiennes. It is. Rafe. Is it? Yeah. Oh. Rafe. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Rafe well, Fiennes. My entire life yeah. I've been saying his name wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, dude. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, Sorry, it's, buddy. Pronou- it's pronounced Ralph. So, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, it's not. It's spelled Ralph. It is. It's oh, my God. Ralph, so. I super fucked that up. All right. Yeah. I don't know why you let me be the host. Yeah. Um, he is a former cop turned VR porn peddler yeah. who gets a tape that shows a murder and then hijinks ensues. Uh, also, very. Hi- imp- <laughs> Wha- wacky hijinks ensue. <laughs> Comedy cavalcade. Yeah. Also importantly, yeah. Angela Bassett's amazingness is basically wasted by having her make googly eyes at Nero the whole movie. We will talk about that. Okay. The next film we uh, subjected ourselves to, again, because we've all seen this at least once before. It was my first time. <gasps> it was my first time. Carol has never seen Hackers, yeah. which is I also strangely... Oh! Whoa, Really? It hey was. Yo. Man, you should have listened to me when I said we should have talked about the net and not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you were right. I will. I will say this, nah. and I want you to feel free to have Phil clip that, me saying you were right and play it over and over again to help yourself fall asleep at night. You were right. You were right. You were right. <laughs> I'm into it. All right, let me let me set this up, and then we can be shocked about this revelation. Hackers is also strangely from 1995. It's directed by, I'm assuming Ian, but I could be saying this wrong, softly. Uh, And it's about a child prodigy hacker who, along with his ragtag group of weirdos when he gets older, uh, are I'm so bad at this, (laughs) are framed uh, for a major hack into like the hardest to get into computer system. Also, Angelina Jolie is in this and she has the opposite of googly eyes. I think she has pouty face. Mm. You know, women aren't the best in these movies. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, anyways, okay, Strange Days and Hackers. Yeah. I, both of you have never seen Hackers? No. No, I, I well, haven't seen it. How did this it. not come out? So well, we actually had an extensive conversation about what movies we were going to yeah. watch, and it was never brought up that they had ne- Have you seen Strange Days? Many, many times. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I deliberately, I, I voted for Hackers because I hadn't seen it and because I had this image in my mind that it was this very slick, cool film. Oh, oh God, no. No. I was like, yeah, well, I, clearly I was super duper wrong. But um, but I was like, yeah, you know what? I don't know why I've never seen this. I can't wait to be, you know, just like airdropped back into 90s, uh, you know, hacker aesthetic culture like let me <laughs> let me uh, you know like razor cut my hair and you know put on a choker necklace and just get into it and within 30 seconds i knew i had made a very very deep mistake i mean i don't regret what I, I i think it's not a good film at all but i don't regret <laughs> watching it because i do think it it is an interesting sort of cultural touchstone uh, and of the moment in which it was released. Like, there's a... I, I want to quote briefly from... Uh, there's a, a, a hacker manifesto that is quoted in, briefly in the film, and I'm going to read what they what they read, because I think it speaks to, like, a kind of 90s, like, early internet hopefulness about the, the net as a potential kind of utopia for, like, justice and, like, you know, the the... 
uh, for individuals kind of um, d- d- uh, r- rising up against like oppressive corporations and governments and things like that. Um, the one of the sort of anti uh, hacker cops um, in the film reads quotes from the manifesto. Cacker's saying, this is our world now, the world of the electron and the switch, the beauty of the bawd. We exist without nationality, skin color, or religious bias. Notice no mention of gender. Um, You wage wars, murder, cheat, lie to us and try to make us believe it's for our own good, yet we're the criminals. Um, And then, like, one of the cops says, yeah, that's cool. And the other one says, it's not cool, it's commie bullshit. (laughs) Um, So this is really interesting because as I was watching both of these movies, um, I kept thinking about like when they were from and the the tension of um, the sort of fear mongering, right? The fear of the Internet. And I actually sort of just Googled and I found an article that that the title says 1995 marked the birth of Internet paranoia films. And I was like, oh, my God, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking as I was watching this. And weirdly enough, in 1995, the net hackers, Johnny Mnemonic and Strange Days and um, GoldenEye and Virtuosity all came out. Wow, Virtuosity. Yeah, like they all came out in the same year. So not only like... Basically, yeah. my instinct was right here in terms of like because the the internet was still kind. It was it was not new, but it was getting more widespread adoption yeah. in homes, and so you got a lot of like the parental fear of their kids getting online, people not really knowing what it's about, and Hollywood has this habit of tapping into those fears. So if you look at like post nine eleven films, there's a lot of like sort of like fears and fear mongering against Arabs, right? Yeah, and, and Muslims, and just paranoia around. Yeah, like to, like yeah. even. In Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, there's this moment where when the aliens like first arrive and start attacking uh, little Dakota Fanning, I think, like as they're speeding away, like looks out the back of the car and says, like, is it the terrorists? You know, and there's like American flags on all the homes. So like a lot of films were responding to this post 9-11 angst. But yeah, in the mid 90s, I guess there was like, oh, you know, tapping into particularly that like teen or like the, the fascination that and the impact that the emerging internet was having on the lives of like of young of young people. Yeah, and with Strange Days interestingly, like you don't really correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't really see tech and technological advancement in the world of 1999 at the time other than these VR headsets. Right. And so the only thing is this sort of like um, you know, they're basically you. You can be anything in yeah. them, right? So the idea of the headsets in Strange Days is that you put this weird webby squid thing on your head, and you can then you feel the experiences of what you're watching. So if yeah. it's someone skydiving or surfing or whatever, but a robbing lot of a, it robbing a convenience store, exa- yeah, exactly. And a lot of it is porn, right? Um, and the film deals specifically with like. Um, snuff porn. Yeah. Uh, and that's where you go in it. But I was like, but there's no other tech. There's only shitty tech. And Angela Bassett's character is the character that that embodies that like anti-tech, Luddite kind of like, this is all bad. And we didn't ever see anything that wasn't underground and sort of shitty. Yeah. So uh, l- let me say, so Strange Days was a film that was you know around the time that it came out I was like I was like a sophomore in college and I loved this movie I loved it so much Me that too. that like I I would have said like and a lot of people really didn't like it even then like a lot of people just reacted like just bounced off of it hard and and like I was such a obnoxious fan of the film that my my attitude would have been like oh well you just don't get it like like sure. I like cuz to me like the image of of like so it you know it ends with it ends like right as 2000, you know, New Year's, midnight, you know, New Year's 99 and 1999 into 2000. And like Ray Fiennes and Angela Bassett, you know, share this kiss. And it's like this. It, I just found that image like so hopeful and like poetic and like deeply like m- moving. And now when I, you know, obviously like now I think back on the film and... um it, I, there's a lot of issues with it. There's a lot of issues with it. And yet I still can't help but admire something about like its boldness, like its willingness to kind of just be like to create this kind of like turn of the millennium fable. Yeah. So I watched it inappropriately young mm-hmm. uh, and 
I remember for some reason. So my sister's 10 years older than me. I remember her and her friends talking about how these two movies they needed to watch was Strange Days and A Clockwork Orange. Oh. So I went and watched both of those movies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, like you assigned yourself homework because you were like, I got I to gotta be ready to talk about this. You know, if I'm ever called up to hang out with my big sister. I did not finish watching A Clockwork Orange for reasons that are probably obvious. I was way too young to be watching this show. How did you get uh, access to these things? I, like, honestly, the... The amount of things I had access to as a child that I shouldn't have, I have no idea. But I think it had to do with immigrant parents who don't know what's what (laughs) in the world. But I have very fond memories of Strange Days. Like, I remember being very sucked in with the aesthetic. I remember, like, just being so in, in, like, just like Angela Bassett is so fucking cool. Oh, my God. I had the biggest crush on Juliette Lewis for a long time. So that, like, her stupid ass songs I thought were the coolest thing ever. And I rewatched it. I think I hadn't seen it until I rewatched it this week. It's fucking horrifying. Yeah, like that... I did not realize one. I didn't realize the amount of of violence against women, women and the yeah. graphicness of it, yeah. and I didn't realize it was a story about police brutality. Like I didn't, I don't, I didn't remember any of that. So watching it felt like watching it again for the first time, almost. You know that saying, "The past is a different country; they do things differently there." It was so weird watching both of these films this weekend and just feeling completely unable to access the part of my brain that would have and did eat up um, these kind of narratives back in the 90s. Because like Caro, I was a huge Strange Days fan when this movie came out. Um, I, I know I saw it a couple of times in the theater and have seen it, you know, since then. Not recently, but had seen it, you know, since 95, several times. And yet, watching it again this time, I just thought, I don't, I don't know that I can even understand who I was back then and what I loved about it. I'm not going to lie. Juliette Lewis's music, I still loved it. There was a part of me that was convinced this was the way forward for music, you know? (laughs) You know, like hot, you know, girl singer and like a heavy guitar. Like I still get off on that shit, you know? No shame. Um, But I'm watching it and I'm thinking, I used to be so invested invested in the relationship between Lenny and Macy. And uh, okay, how now was I was it? like, yeah, Macy, I, if you don't kick this fool the right. fuck out of your limo, I how, don't know. Listen, how weird it, is it to watch them now and be like rooting against them and being like, why the fuck does Angela Bassett like this fool? Like, but at the time you're like, oh no, you want like, She's a good influence. And yeah, blah, blah, blah. you yeah. know, he she she knows that he has the capacity to be better, right? And she yeah. th- and she's in love with that the idea of him as that better person that he has the capacity to be and that he, or that he used to be. That he used to be. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and yeah, then, because yeah. the flashback where she's wearing that amazing <laughs> wig <laughs> and and made it for But yeah, absolutely. Macy and represents like, you know, for lack of a better term, like his better angels, right? You know, the the part of Lenny that has not become Come sort of, you know, completely um, morally dissolute in this, you know, neon tinged underworld in which he now um, operates. But just as a grown ass woman, I'm like, Macy, Macy, this dude, like you, girl, do not let this dude any further into your life. He is poison. He is poison. Yeah, so- and no matter what. Uh, Faith ultimately was responsible for. I was so uncomfortable by the way that Lenny pursues her throughout this movie and refuses to let go. Like, that's not romantic, you know? But at the time I first saw this movie, I was like, that's just mad romantic, yo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really disturbing, like, the... I feel like this is a very indicative sign of the times and the shifting. Like, not to say this wouldn't happen today, but I think it would be a lot harder to make this film in this way in 2018, right? I I feel like the scene, at least for me in particular, the scene in which we so viscerally experience an act of such brutal violence against a woman through the squid, right? Uh, Somebody has recorded uh, a woman just being brutalized and then uh, uh, Lenny uh, plays it back and sort of experiences it. I mean, it's just, 
it's so hor it's so horrible well, and also watching that so okay i mean i'm assuming a lot of our listeners have have watched it but yeah. like so the the way that it goes down is that the person doing the rape and murder is wearing the squid so you're watching it through their eyes right. but then they tap into they put one on their victim so their victim feels what the rapist is feel like it is so many it's, layers of fucked up and yeah. then you're watching like Lenny and others play back this whole experience and you're watching them struggle with like getting off because the feelings that are being forced into their body, but their conscious mind is like, this is fucking horrifying. Like, I think that they're, that's part of why I'm like there. This is this paranoia about technology, Mm. but also like, I think they do a really good job of showing just how like, the the extremes of the tech and how fucking horrible like this experience is like there's no part of us that are that doesn't see that it's horrific absolutely but it's still we uh, th- this is a larger conversation about how we depict violence against women and it's not yeah. about the women it's about Lenny and his like attempt to redeem himself as a you know a cop gone bad or whatever yeah and I think you know the film certainly implicates um the audience in that way right because we yeah. watch it so we we see what happens um but the the layers to it right so yeah this the woman who is being victimized is forced to not only watch her victimization but to experience um the visceral th- thrill that her attacker is getting from it and we as audience members are doing the same thing right like we have been you know drawn in to this world and in this particular moment we are taking you know uh our, like our filmic joy in and watching this scene play out um but in a larger sense too yeah like this is this is how violence against women is visually presented to us you know as something that we can consume kind of uncritically um something that we can take some sort of enjoyment you know for different you know uh meanings of the the word enjoyment but i do think the film you know is is pretty clear about suggesting like having a squid is not necessary. We are always already doing this when it comes to violence against women, you know, and women are forced to consume it. Yeah. Mm. The the other thing that you brought up in terms of like the other sort of real gendered thing here is the way you were saying that you were you were uh, bothered by the sort of stalking aspect of Lenny and Juliet's character Mm -hmm. i forget what her name is faith faith that's right um they do so this is one of those other fucked up like no 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 yes trope things where he's trying to get her back and she keeps saying no but the film keeps insinuating that she's in a bad situation and she doesn't want to be there and if he just keeps pursuing her he like he'll uncover it and she'll like finally get out and you see that because she runs away with him because she does want to get out because she's afraid and so I think that's also a part of this larger, like, like really awful gender representations of like not listening to women when like they're like, stop stalking me, you fucking psycho ex. Um, well, is psycho a bad word? Can I say psycho? I think in, in I this don't, context. I yeah, okay. <laughs> I was like, but I don't know if it's like an yeah. ableist word. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, let me know if it is, yeah. people. Um, but so like th- just across the board, all of these women are here like sort of perpetuating these tropes and not like not really being it's all about Lenny and his relationship to these women. And they're all just a part of his emotional growth and journey. Yeah. In the, but in a really fucked up way. Yeah. And the in, strange days is such a seductive aesthetic. Like they do a really, I mean, Catherine Bigelow is a good director, right? Like she does a really good job of building this aesthetic, which is so in contrast to hackers in every single (laughs) way. And I'm really curious what you both felt about like watching these back to back and having never seen hackers before. Uh, Hackers definitely felt goofy. Like it felt goofy. I I mean, and I think uh, like self goofy in a self-aware sense when, when uh, so Fisher Stevens is the, the main villain in this film, uh, who a man who insists ridiculously on being referred to as the plague, like even in, in meat, you know, quote unquote, meat space. Um, and like one of his, I think one of his first lines in the film is a, a, a sort of 
tech security guard at the massive corporation he works for, played by Penn Jillette, of all people, like calls him up on the phone. He's like, we have a problem here. And, uh, and, <laughs> and Fisher Stevens response, you know, is something like, you hapless techno weenie, which is just like the most ridiculous, like hilarious kind of goofy, uh, uh, hacker thing, you know? And, um, but, you know, this film, too, like, its gender politics are so revealingly kind of messed up as well, because it's a space in which, so Angelina Jolie is a, like, remarkably sp- skilled hacker who goes by the handle of Acid Burn. But the film, like, at every step of the way, needs to sort of undercut her skill by just one and show that oh she'll she'll never be like quite as good as as uh, crash override slash zero cool um, you know the main character like from the, the like the, the first thing that happens one of the first things that happens between them is that um, is that uh, crash override like beats her high score at a video game can we wait can we talk about yeah. this skate park slash arcade spot yeah, that yeah, they yeah, have yeah, in because yeah. like I kind of <laughs> wish that existed for totally like, I really. I don't we're, know why. We're, <laughs> just, all, we're all the 13 year olds are smoking and eating fries. <laughs> wow. No, that's so good. I, I, this movie, yeah. it felt to me like something that it, it felt like a bunch of 47 year olds had written this script and they were like, this is how kids talk, right? You know, like like the product of a couple of divorced dads who haven't seen their kids in months. And they were like, oh, yeah, you know, Chad is constantly telling me about these video games he plays. This is this this is this is great. You know, this is how kids behave these days. You know, again, Steve Buscemi, how are we doing, fellow kids? Oh, my God. I I just think it's a failure as a as a piece of uh, engaging storytelling in the sense that it builds up to a climax that. Um, so the, you know, the big climax is like, uh, Fisher Stevens on one end, like tapping a bunch of buttons on a keyboard at the corporation versus the four, whatever lead hacker kids tapping a bunch of keys on their keyboards, you know, to prevent the, this virus from like capsizing these ships and whatever. And, (laughs) and like, like they, they cannot even create like a, an, a visual interface for this conflict that makes like compelling sense. So we as viewers don't really understand at any point, like what anyone is actually really doing and what the state, you know, it's all this ridiculous stuff like, Oh, you know, one, one of the, one of the young hackers puts like a rabbit in the, in the data. And we see this rabbit like replicating and stuff. And then there's like this Pac-Man figure that's like gobbling up the data, but it's all just like, meaningless because the film has in no way like established what's actually happening and that the the aesthetic of hacking in this is so terrible so terrible it's so like here's the thing about film like once film and television started to talk about like tech it was actually a big struggle and that's why you, there's like these ongoing jokes about like zoom in or like you know like yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, zoom in enhance yeah zoom in enhance <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? where you're like because you need to make it visual yeah. so that it's interesting but like programming is not an interesting visual thing and so these are the early days of filmmakers trying to figure out how to do it and and the like the pillars of code in the like the big corporate like yeah. terminal right and they kept throwing out words like terminal and kernel and all the shit which are real things but they just yeah. it didn't and mean anything like what Ebony was saying yeah I- it's fascinating that that stuff can work like on the page. If you, when you read, say, Neuromancer, like the, you know William Gibson's like landmark cyberpunk novel, and he's able to describe cyberspace or the Matrix as these like columns of light and data, and it's stuff like he can convey it as like beautiful and kind of spiritual almost because it's a place where you know you're not attached to your body and it's just this realm, but of data. But we've never been able to to create that cinematically in a way that's actually, well, I that think, works. I think that the way that people talk about tech in film and television only works when they are talking about human stories and not about the tech. Absolutely. So like Halt and Catch Fire is a perfect example where it's never cheesy and you're actually seeing a lot of tech stuff. Yeah. But it's all about the character so it doesn't matter if they're sitting there programming or not, right? Yeah. But this does bring up a question because four years, I think it's four years later, The Matrix comes out. Yeah. And The Matrix is like widely heralded as like the epic 
you know, like 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 oh, finally a, a legitimately good kind of su- yeah, cyberpunk. Yeah, and the like green and black the, code is oh, yeah. apparently the thing that's yeah. like. I mean, it works. It looks. It actually looks cool instead of looking goofy. Yeah, but and everything still looks in this good. isn't. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's clean, right? It looks clean. Um, there's a, in this film, there's a hilarious, and you know, in my mind, and with the with the the the, the perspective of time, you know, twenty years on, like there's a hilarious kind of sequence where Johnny Lee Miller's character is just like hacking for like you know two days straight or something, and it's basically like his face just. Uh, um, with all these like formulas and stuff like flying and floating around it. Um, and I tweeted, I tweeted like photos from it. And I was, you know, my, my thing was like, Oh, that feeling when you're hacking the net and, <laughs> and somebody uh, very accurately was like, Oh, you know, this is if, if yeah. uh, elementary was mm-hmm. more like Sherlock, you know, cause on Sherlock, you know how he goes into his like mind palace. It was a lot like that. That's like, really Oh, if, thing. if, yeah, if we'd see that on, on elementary, if Johnny Lee Miller entered his like mind palace. One of the reasons I was so excited to watch this is because of Johnny Lee Miller, who I'm a huge fan of because of elementary. And I, I've talked about this before. He is one of the most expressive actors I've ever enjoyed watching. But it was so interesting to see a younger version of him because it was pretty quickly apparent to me that he needs the canvas of an older man's face for that to work for me. Um, You know, like I just there's there's something about the way that he has matured as an actor. If you were to tell me that Johnny Lee Miller was going to be in a film today about, you know, uh, technology and the dissolution of the social order or whatever, I would be so into it. And speaking of casting, if I were to tell people who have not seen Hackers that the cast includes people like Wendell Pierce. Seriously, Felicity bunk. Huffman, yeah. Lorraine Bracco, yeah. Mark Anthony, Penn Mark, Gillette, and right? Fisher Stevens. Would yeah. you ever no. in a million years think, oh yeah, that cast, that's got to be about the net. You know, <laughs> that's got to yeah. be about the internet. Lorraine Bracco, I am not entirely convinced she knew what movie she was in. She was so <laughs> befuddled throughout this whole thing. And I want someone to clip for me the scene where she's just going, Cancer, brain, brain, brain cancer. cancer. I know. Brain, well, so watching <laughs> her, watching her, I kept being like, were they told? Were the direction? Were they told to be over the top and ridiculous? Because they like, had to have been right. I was they like, had to are been. you that terrible? You're not that terrible of an actor. Like how? No. Like that was so excessive. Like she was like five steps excessively worse than almost everybody in it in terms of that particular. Except type for of like the FBI agents, yeah. right? Like the uh, the other hilariously over the top thing was the FBI agents um, trying to, like, blend in with the youths, at, you know, at the parties or at the park or whatever. And just <laughs> the completely uncool way they did it seemed to be very self-conscious. I could not put my finger on what this movie was doing. I honestly, like, tonally, it felt all over the place. And I couldn't tell if it was kind of, you know, winking and nudging into the campy territory or if it was just that incompetent at times. But I will have, I do have to say, I am very grateful for this movie, for presenting Angelina Jolie to me as a Vulcan because she looked so much <laughs> like she should have been in Starfleet that I was like, yo, I didn't know I needed Angelina Jolie as a Vulcan, but now I know. So knowing now that Johnny Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie got married after this movie, yo. I was watching the movie being like, oh, there's got to be like intense chemistry between the nothing. No, there's no <laughs> chemistry between them. I think their marriage lasted like six months or so shit like that. I don't think... I don't know. This is a conversation maybe for another time. But this movie forced me, this movie forced a lot of emotions out of me. But I was like, you know what? I really enjoyed Angelina Jolie and Gia the way that a yes. lot of people did. But yeah, I don't think she's a good actor. I don't know. We, we should have a bigger conversation about that. Cause, yeah, yeah, let's do. Because I, I really want to unpack. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, like I said, you know, she was young in this. So if I'm, you know, cutting Johnny Lee Miller a break, I got to cut Angelina a break, too. But I haven't seen similar growth from her in her, you know, most recent work. So 
I really quickly want to mention the the queer rep- or the, the the stuff around queer issues in in hackers. So like, there's one scene where uh, the the hacker known as the Phantom Freak is like being escorted past uh, all these like inmates in prison, and they're all like reaching out to him and like pawing him and clawing him, and it's really like scary and it's obviously like meant to make us uh, uncomfortable like oh he's you know what is what's going to happen to him in in jail and also like it weirdly positions him as like this kind of pretty you know uh feminine kind of figure and then um but then there's also these two like asian hackers who are who end up being kind of important in the story who are super queer coded um yeah, I mean, yeah. There's also the trans joke, the, the anti-trans joke. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this. Yeah. Oh boy, that's well. Then at the not... very beginning, when um, when uh, fucking Johnny Lee Miller, whatever his character's name is, is with his mom, and she asks, like, "You like girls? Oh, you like girls, you? don't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah." And then he, you know, slams into the bathroom, and then one of the weirdest line readings is like, "Yeah, and I'm still a virgin." <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. was like, I don't know if that was meant to be like, you know, yeah, and I'm still a virgin and I hate it, you know, like I'm kind of a horny youth or, you know, no, like, of course, a, a bad kid like me would constantly be out, you know, banging um, my fellow high school students, whatever. I don't know. It, it was, was super weird. a weird, weird movie. I have one final question before we move on. Mm-hmm. Are you ready for this question? <laughs> Is it about how to pronounce Ray Fiennes? I did. You know what? I did know that. And as you said it, and I've been thinking about it, I was like, I did know that, but I read it because I read. Yeah, I don't even. I feel girl is cool. About it. You it's should fine. hang out with Whatever. my dad. My dad still calls him Ralph Finus. <laughs> Your dad's amazing. All right, <laughs> yes. all right. My question: Do you think that Johnny Lee Miller, our favorite Sherlock ever, mm-hmm. learned how to rollerblade for the part, or girl. was already a rollerblading pro? Wow. The, the, the rollerblade escape in this movie <laughs> gave me everything I needed to get through the rest of that Saturday. I was like, I I forgot how big rollerblading was, you know? Like, yeah. People yeah. thought that shit was the wave. No moment in this film gave me more joy than the moment where uh, Fisher Stevens and Johnny Lee Miller arranged to like swap a disc or exchange a disc. And so Johnny Lee Miller's like on the street holding out the disc and along comes <laughs> Fisher Stevens like on a skateboard, like holding on to the corporate limo or whatever. And he like, j- like speeds by Johnny Lee Miller, grabs the disc, and then they just roll on and like vanish into this cloud of New York City steam. Oh, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> so good. Okay, let's move on to what's your freak out, Ebony? Yeah, what's your freak out this week? Oh boy, I apologize in advance to all three of our listeners and to my two lovely co-hosts. My freak out this week is Tom Cruise. Okay, hmm. please go on. And you know what? We may need to have... Okay, so let's have an Angelina Jolie conversation in a future episode. Let's also talk about Tom Cruise because there is something so phenomenologically like interesting about Tom Cruise, the actor, um, you know, like the, the blockbuster actor, um, but also Tom Cruise, the person and the way our understanding of both gets folded into... Whatever. So y'all know I am a hardcore fan of the action grandpa genre. Doesn't matter if it's Liam Neeson. Do, do we know Denzel that Washington? Well, I knew I knew it because it's come up on Cinema Ball. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like news, news flash. Me. News flash to everybody. Big fan of the action gramps uh, genre because I think there's something so interesting about the specter of. Uh, an older man kind of refusing to acquiesce physically to younger men, <laughs> no, like literally, um, but also symbolically. Like I'm fascinated by this, right? So I'm very interested in Tom Cruise and the way that he is approaching um, his entries into the action gramps genre via like Mission Impossible. Uh, obviously, like that's the huge one, but also the Jack Reacher movies. So I have not read any of the Jack Reacher novels, 
but they are incredibly successful. I think there's like 20 of them shits now. And it's about this guy who is a physical giant, like seven feet tall and just like built like a refrigerator. And he's this nomad who travels the country. He doesn't own anything. He literally wears his clothes until they, you know, are like fall off and then, you know, buys a newsman and, you know, just has like no trail and he's former military intelligence and you can write the rest of the story from there. Right. And so, you know, goes around the country essentially being like a vigilante and occasionally getting called in like Rambo to straighten out like, you know, um, like drug cartels or whatever. Right. So this very popular series of books, Tom Cruise buys the rights and decides to play the main character. Now, again, Jack Reacher in the books is a physical giant. Tom Cruise, the older he gets, is like, yep, yeah, you know what role I want to play? Jack Reacher. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I want to know what's going on mentally as he kind of processes his aging and his still like, you know, one of the things we talk about when a new Tom Cruise film comes out is like how he does his own stunts and you know, how he's very um, like physically still very kind of dominant. Right. But there's just something so interesting going on. So anyways, I'm watching the last Jack Reacher movie uh, like a week ago and I was just struck by how uh, compared to Mission Impossible, for instance, you can really see the way that Tom wears his age. It's not as slick. It's not as um, uh, polished as the Mission Impossible movies, as you would expect. It doesn't have nearly the budget, right? But we we got to talk about um, the 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 very like sort of twentieth century version of this and how it stands in you know comparison to the way um this used to come about in like westerns or whatever where you also had older men you know fighting for law and order and truth and justice and whatever but there wasn't this sort of insistence upon them you know carrying their bodies in the way that um like Liam Neeson and Tom Cruise have to do it I don't know I'm freaking out you guys I want to talk <laughs> about this hit me up on Twitter I can't stop thinking about it <laughs> All right. All right. What are they? Jack Reacher, keep on reaching. Jack Reacher, oh reach yes. harder. <laughs> Wait, be, is oh. that real? Or are those Jack Reacher, those to yeah. Jack to reach? Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm making good. those up, but yeah. I, I have... It blows oh, my boy. mind that they even made a second one of those movies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, I don't even know that that movie exists. Uh, yeah, what's your freak All out, right, Carol? my freak out is I've been playing a bunch of a game uh, called Shadowrun Dragonfall, um, which is a cyberpunk um, RPG. It was put out by Harebrain Schemes. I've been streaming it on our Twitch channel. And, um, you know, given that we've been talking about cyberpunk stuff, like, um, so the combat in Harebrain Schemes cyber, uh, Shadowrun games is kind of like xcom -y. You know, you, 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 it's turn-based. You take cover. You, there's, like, percentages of your likelihood to hit uh, uh, with your attacks and all that stuff. And I don't love that kind of combat, but everything around that stuff in the game is is really excellent in terms of the the world building, the writing, the characterizations, and you know, in particular, these games and um, you know, uh, uh, Dragonfall, um, in, especially thus far, is so great about having um, a range of uh, uh, you know female characters who break the the traditional mold of the the roles that female characters traditionally fill in games. They're not by any means. Um, sort of sexualized or kind of nudged into these kind of pre-existing molds. Like you really have um, a, a wide range of um, characterizations and um, the game is so uh, explicit in its sort of um, anti-fascist like politics to, um, you know, obviously set contextualize in this, in this future world where, um, where, you know, you have, like, um, trolls and elves and orcs and things, and so, like, they're, they're, the, they're the ones being persecuted, but the, but the game makes no bones about creating those direct connections between, like, persecution of them and, like, like, uh, like actual fascist kind of ideologies. I think it's extremely, you know, it's, it's, it's well done for that kind of thing, and, um, it's just a really gripping narrative. Um, it's um, 
the, again, like the characterizations, the writing is so, so strong that it really pulls you into that world and that story. And yeah, so the game came out a few years ago. I'm only really getting around to it now. But, um, you know, in keeping with the theme, our cyberpunk theme, if you are at all interested in cyberpunk genre and, you know, you play role playing games, um, definitely check out uh, Shadowrun Dragonfall if you get a chance. Cool. Yeah. I'm freaking out about capitalism. Oh, so rad. This will be re- quick. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, specifically in relation to libraries. So libraries are deeply anti-capitalist by nature. They're a shock that they even exist anymore. They would not exist today if they were invented today. If someone was like, hey, let's set up in every city several buildings full of books and movies and items that the public can take away for free and then return all the time. That would yeah. never that would never uh, the, happen. The only way it would happen today is if it was proposed by Elon Musk as some kind of like new visionary idea and he figured out some way to make like And it was, there's a membership There's theme. like some yeah, exactly. make a ton yeah. of make a ton of money off of it. Yeah. So I fucking love libraries. I think you should support the hell out of libraries. Uh and you know, Ebony and I used the, our local public libraries a lot for our upcoming book History versus Women, which mm. you can pre order now at historyversuswomen.com. Um, but here's the thing. I've been, uh, checking out quote unquote, a lot of eBooks from the library, which is a cool, it's a cool thing you can do like, you know, whatever. Um, and I read most of my books on Kindle anyway, so it's nice to have that option. Um, but here's the thing that pisses me off. The way that you can rent eBooks is you go and you look or on it. borrow. Borrow. Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, you look them up on an app. And if so, if the library has five copies of book X, then only five people can have it checked out at yeah. a time. Yeah. And if all five people have them checked out, you are put on hold and you put the book on hold as you would a physical book. So the model for ebooks is exactly the same as physical books. When it becomes available, you are then informed that it is available and you can check it out. They are digital fucking books. Yeah. There are no limitations yeah. to how many copies can be released at a time. So the fact I think and I didn't I meant to look this up. Someone told me this many years ago, so I don't know if it's different. But I believe what I was told, <laughs> which I love that I'm spreading fucking rumors right now, <laughs> is that publishers insist that ebooks be treated like physical books and that they can only be checked out a certain amount of times before the book actually physically falls apart and can't be checked out anymore. And so they're treating it the same way. And this shit pisses me off because it's it's an issue of access and finances, right? Libraries have to pay for these for these licenses. Um, fuck that shit. I'm freaking out against capitalism. Like, we should be able to check out all of the ebooks. Everyone should have access to them all the time. And it's just, it yeah. makes me really upset. I've been on the waiting list for Fifty Shades Darker for so long now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just slip Carol. you my copy, Caro. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Ebony. All right, y'all. Um, you can submit your own freak out if you got something on your mind at femfreak doc no at feministfrequency.com slash freakout. That's F R E Q O U T. And that's our show. So you can catch us back here every single Wednesday. And remember that we would love it if you joined our podcast community and help us bring this delightful show to you every week at d.rip slash femfreak. Hey, Carolyn. Hey. If people are enjoying the show, what should they do? They should hack the planet so that every website on the planet simultaneously starts flashing the words, uh, you know, femfreak, uh, d.rip slash femfreak. Can it not be that? Can Can it be... No, we like that. We like that. We don't, we don't hate that URL at no. all. It's not the worst URL that's ever existed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, but you can also, um, we'd love it if you would rate and review us on iTunes because that helps. Yeah, if lot. you want to take the easy path, I mean, there's sure, that. There's sure. that too. But. Either way, yeah, whichever it's, it's one. Very, it's very helpful and very appreciated. Also, while you are on your rollerblades hacking the net at the same time, tell your friends about Feminist Frequency Radio and that they might be interested. You can check out all of our work and our other podcasts at FeministFrequency.com. And you can follow us on Twitter at FemFreak to stay up to date on all of the news. You can also find each of us on Twitter, which we will read every single tweet you send us. <laughs> Psych. No, we won't. <laughs> I'm at Anita Sarkeesian. I'm at Carolyn Michelle. 
I am at brain cancer, cancer, brain, brain cancer. <laughs> Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music, technical support by Sarah Norales, and art by Jamie Varon. We'll see you all next week. Later. Bye. You were right.